Hello to all physics enthusiasts and experiment lovers. I'm Alexei Kolchin, and in today's video, we're going to talk about the cycle of atmospheric electricity. And we'll start by talking about the Earth's electric field. It turns out that the Earth is negatively charged. And the average electric field strength near the Earth's surface is about 130 volts per meter. Well, this means that at a height equal to my height from the top of my head to my heels, the voltage drops to about 200 volts, but I don't feel it at all. Just like probably you do. So why does this happen? The thing is, my body is a conductor, and when I stand barefoot on the ground, my potential matches that of the Earth. Well, just like in any conductor, there is no electric field in my body. That's why I don't feel anything. But by the way, during this process, there is a redistribution of charges, and my head becomes negatively charged. But how did they measure this electric field? Of course, we can take two metal plates, separate them by a height of one meter, and a potential difference of 130 volts will establish between them. But how do we measure it? If we connect a regular voltmeter, we won't see anything. The charges will redistribute very quickly, and the voltmeter won't have time to show anything. That's why measuring the strength of the Earth's electric field requires other, more sophisticated methods. And now Andre will tell you about them. And since the charge on the plates that Alexei mentioned is very small, the plates discharge very quickly when connected. The idea is to produce connecting and disconnecting the plates as often as possible to generate a current of such magnitude that can be registered. And for example, you can take one plate and connect it to the ground through a wire, and then move this plate up and down and see what happens. In this case, the current flows through the connecting wire, and you can short circuit the two plates and swap them around. This way, you can see what current is flowing through the connecting wire right now, and swap them around. This way, you can see what current is flowing through the connecting wire right now. Well, it's clear that it's easier to implement such a design if the two plates are on a rotor connected by a wire through brushes. And in another device, which is like a kind of mill, the plates are sectors that alternate in a circle and are connected. Every other one? Above the plates, there is a shutter that rotates using an electric motor. The shutter alternately shields from the Earth's electric field, so the charge alternately flows from one sector to another. Since the alternating electric current generated in this process is small, a high ohm resistor is placed between the sectors from which we take the voltage. Voltage. And we made a model of such a device with the help of which we can't measure the Earth's electric field here in the apartment where there are strong interferences from the 220 volt network, but we will still show you something. These sectors, the shutter, rotates from the electric motor. And the outputs from the sectors are connected to a 330 k auto resistor. And the voltage from this resistor is measured using a galvanometer. And the shutter is rotating. And the signal that we see right now, that's interference from the 220 volt network. You can't get rid of them in the apartment. And now we will bring an electrified plastic pipe close to our device. And you can see that the signal has noticeably increased. This is the electric field created by the pipe near the setup. We bring the pipe closer and the signal increases. We move it away, it weakens, and thus our demonstration device works. To measure the Earth's electric field, you need to take the device outside, power it with a direct current source Filter the signal at the required frequency, and then we'll get those readings. It's about 130 volts per meter in good weather, because during thunderstorms, that's the uh, intensity of the electric field. It can be noticeably higher. And about how the Earth's electric field is structured in good weather. Now Alexei will speak. I'm handing this over to him. I'll start by saying that knowing the electric field near the Earth's surface is 130 volts per meter. I will find the charge of the Earth. To do this, we need to multiply the surface charge density E0E by the surface area of the Earth. And when we plug in all the numbers, we get that the Earth 
has a negative charge of 500,000. Pendant. But it turns out that as you move away from the Earth's surface, the electric field quickly weakens and practically disappears at an altitude of 10 kilometers. This means that the atmosphere has a positive charge of the same magnitude. 500,000 coulombs together with the Earth forms a kind of capacitor. In this case, air is a good but not perfect insulator. So this capacitor continuously discharges. The measured average leakage current density at the Earth's surface is 2 picomperes per square meter. And the total current is found by multiplying this density by the surface area of the Earth, and it equals 1800 amperes. And knowing the total charge of the capacitor and the leakage current allow us to estimate the time it takes for the capacitor to discharge. And this time is just 300 seconds or 5 minutes. Nevertheless, from experience, we know that the capacitor always remains charged. And then the question arises, what is the source of its recharging? And what is the source of energy that provides this recharging? And it turns out that this atmospheric capacitor is charged thanks to thunderstorms. And the ultimate source of energy for the recharging is the sun. The sun needs to warm the surface of the earth or water. And a powerful upward flow of warm, moist air must form. The air rises up and the temperature gradually drops with altitude, leading to the condensation of water vapor. And even higher, this water vapor turns into tiny ice crystals, which rise even higher, because the height of a typical thunderstorm cloud is about 10 to 12 kilometers. So, accordingly, these ice particles start to stick together. The mass of these little clumps increases, and eventually they start to fall down. And so we have two such streams of particles forming. The smaller ones that are flying up and the larger ones that are already falling down. And due to electrification by friction, the lower part of such a cloud is mainly negatively charged. And the upper part is positively charged. And the first to propose such a model was the Scottish physicist Charles Wilson. The same Wilson who invented the Wilson chamber. And uh, from his perspective, a cloud represents a huge dipole. And although the Earth as a whole is negatively charged, directly beneath the thunderstorm cloud, a positive charge is induced on the surface of the Earth. The potential difference between the cloud and the ground can reach 100 million. Volt! This voltage turns out to be enough for an electrical breakdown to occur and for lightning to strike. A typical lightning bolt carries a negative charge of about 20 coulombs from the cloud to the ground. Pendant on Earth, about 100 lightning strikes occur every second, which results in a charging current of around 2000 amps. And this current compensates for the leakage currents and keeps the Earth's charge constant. So thunderclouds turn out to be unique electric generators that constantly recharge the Earth's capacitor. Lesha. Can you tell me, how did they find out that there are 100 lightning strikes per second on the planet? Did they really count them all? Really? Well, the network of meteorological observation is quite dense. Well, people also observe in their local areas how many thunderstorms happen on average and how many lightning strikes come from thunderclouds. So, that's how the statistics are gathered. And then we need to sum everything up across the globe. So, we will get the average value. Well, and of course, satellites probably help now, too. All right, then a more substantial question. Look, oh, our cloud has charged up, down, negatively and positively up. Then, bam, lightning strikes, and the negative charge from the bottom of the cloud goes to the Earth. And the positive charge at the top just stays there. Really? But we need to recharge both plates, of the capacitor, the atmospheric one, and the earthly one. How does the positive charge end up being distributed throughout the atmosphere? That's a very good question. The thing is, in our model, we haven't added one element yet. As you go higher, the conductivity of the air increases. And this is related to the fact that cosmic rays enter the Earth's atmosphere and ionize the air. And although its density decreases with altitude, the effect of cosmic rays becomes stronger. And the layer with the highest conductivity is located at about 18 kilometers high. Clouds near the top spread and charge spreads across the layer. So we should have a leak and then it disperses. Positive charge disperses, charges spread. 
And the positive charge gradually and evenly spreads across the conductive layer. Well, of course, these are just the plates of the capacitor, and if we place the machine in one spot that charges them, then the charges should spread everywhere. If the plates are conductive... Yes, and that's how the circuit closes. And of course, it's important to emphasize that atmospheric physics is a very complex science. Here we've provided a very simplified model related to atmospheric electricity phenomena. And the complexity of this science lies in the fact that only a small number of phenomena can be reproduced in laboratory conditions. For the most part, we have to deal with field measurements, gather statistics from all over the globe, and delve into the mysteries. Thunderstorm phenomena, as described in Daniel Grannon's book. I'm going into the storm. And now we move on to our traditional concluding question. And for that, we need to take a look at the map showing the distribution of thunderstorms across the Earth's surface. And here we see that thunderstorms occur quite frequently over land, especially often in the Central Africa region, but thunderstorms happen rarely over the surface of seas and oceans. Although it might seem that in tropical latitudes there are all the conditions for the formation of thunderstorm clouds, the sun there heats quite strongly. The humidity is high and warm, moist air should be rising from the surface of the water, and yet thunderstorms happen rarely there. So why does this happen? Share your thoughts on uh, this in the comments of our video on YouTube.